thank you to everyone for turning out this evening for the lecture. Um, thank you also to EAG for inviting me to make to give you this talk. Um, I'm looking forward to be able to tell you a bit more about this research project that we have been awarded. Um, it's called Geocast Go. Um, it's hindcasting and forecasting geotechnical operation windows of seabed mobility and SCOUR based on global wind farm GIS, CFD modeling and MLAI. Hopefully by the end of this, that some of that will make a little bit more sense for those of you who don't, uh, yeah, who don't really understand what it means. Um, so in order to try and walk you through this, I try to break, break this up into quite simple, uh, yeah, simple terms, just to try and understand who we are, who are undertaking this project, who's funding us, what we're trying to do, so what's the background of the project, and what is the experience of offshore wind construction in Europe, and then also finally the how. So how are we going to try and achieve these projects? So the project is funded by an organization called the Ocean Energy Safety Institute. Um, it's been established through collaboration between the B Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, or BESI, and the Department of Energy in the US. Um, it aims to support safety and environmental advancements in offshore energy, including renewables and traditional sectors, so oil and gas, uh, and also going into kind of aggregate or marine aggregate mining as well. Um, so the key aims are trying to increase the energy security of the US and kind of create jobs and increase the economic activity through sustainable use of the seabed. They want to try and develop the technologies uh, and training to increase the ability of the US to produce ocean energy safely and sustainably across all of these different energy generation types. Um, and they're looking to engage the best technologists, managers, facilitators, uh, and us uh, to yeah, achieve their goals in the most efficient way. Um, so, Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Um, so the University of Florida and the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, they are bringing the computational fluid dynamics aspect of this because yeah, they're worldwide experts in them. And then Atkins Realis are going to bring engineering expertise and try and guide this project in a way that we can try and address kind of real goals and real issues that developers are facing at the moment, um, both over here in Europe and in other sites internationally. So the key aims and objectives are to establish what the evidentiary basis is for modern marine cable failure incidents related to scour and hydraulic instability both at the foundation and also where these cables get exposed by uh, erosion. Uh, so we want to look at regional scale environmental data, including what we can get from publicly available data databases and also from databases that we have in-house from work we've done previously um, to try and define morphodynamic provinces. So morphodynamic representing kind of how the seabed morphology and shape uh, varies by region depending on the water depth and also the meteor meter ocean conditions. Um, we're also identifying and approaching US developers 
Um, so the key being to identify which sites along that eastern, uh, well, along the US continental shelf are best uh, comparable to the sites that we have in Europe, where that significant basis and evidence of offshore wind is. Um, we're going to try and then, or we're going to aim to develop hindcasting and forecasting tools. Hindcasting being looking back and trying to replicate something that you've seen before, and forecasting trying to take that forward into other uh, states. So if you want to look at increased activities and storms, or want to move and change the grain size of the sediments or the water depth, that you have the ability to do that. Um, then we're going to try and use machine learning to uh, and analyze what these modeled outputs are to try and derive the key engineering and economic risks by trying to use the lessons learned from Europe and then applying them to this uh, American continental shelf. So now that you understand who is trying to do this project, let's talk a bit about what the background is and what, what can I, what we're trying to achieve. So. Most quoted estimate for insurance claims for offshore wind is that 75 to 80 percent of all of the insurance claims are related to the cables. Um, it's a known weak point in what has been traditional, the legacy uh, offshore wind sites, the ones that have been constructed decades ago or a few decades ago, and also now the ones that have been recently constructed. It contains, continues to be a problem um, and it can cause a loss of you know, up to as a minimum, I would say 10 million pounds in lost out outputs and repairs just to go and repair a new cable once you have had an issue with it. Um, the problem that tends to happen is you have an issue with a cable because of the design of that cable system. That means it's not just one cable you're going to have to replace. It means most of them sometimes. Um, when we look at the seabed mobility and the impact of these different bed forms on the cable and also on the stability of these cables, what we do is we look across the whole offshore wind farm site. Now, if you think about it, the offshore wind farm sites can be comparable to small countries in terms of area. So you are really making quite sweeping generalizations about what those dynamics are. Um, and you're always, because of the vastness and the amount of complexity that you have in these marine environments, you've got so many different inputs and outputs and different processes, you always have to um make some kind of generalization when you're looking at them um, to try and cover broad areas um, and then also once you have an understanding of what kind of forces that these structures in the seabed and the cables are going through you perform finite element analysis where you basically try and break everything down into small pieces and understand how the forces impact on them but there is also a simplification and a coarsening of your inputs into that because it can't be too complicated. So you just consider it with quite basic properties of the soil and also basic seabed topography. Um, so the, there is definitely issues there. Most of the developed offshore wind farm capacity and in, in the world is in north eastern, no, northwestern Europe and around the UK. Um, it's growing a lot in the East, in Asia. China are building very quickly, um, but still it's not quite as significant as the European um, capability. So we've got 2.1 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity in the first half of last year constructed alone. So it means that we've got a total of 32 gigawatts. Um, if you think about it in terms of energy consumption, your usual typical home would be one kilowatt per hour. So if it's windy, then you are definitely powering a lot of homes. What you do when it's not windy is another problem, but probably we haven't got enough time for that. Um, in the US, on the other hand, there's only one wind farm that's actually been commissioned and constructed. Um, and it estimates that the offshore wind capacity is 850 megawatts. So obviously it's a very nascent industry in comparison to what we have over here in Europe. And the key is to try and understand what, what, what were the lessons? Where did we make mistakes here? And how can we prevent those mistakes from being made in America or really in any other parts of the world? Um, for example, the one of the best projects that looked into cable failures was the cable lifetime monitoring project um, coordinated by the DNV, where they revealed that 
an average of 1.24 failures per 100 circuit kilometres over the years 2006 to 15 in European wind farms. And to try and contextualise that number, uh, wind farm with say 40 turbines, so quite a typical sized one, including the export cable, would probably be around 100, maybe between 150, 200. So you're having one failure a year in every wind farm as a minimum. So this, you can see how this is starting to add up. Um, what I have behind me is a uh, offshore uh, foundation, a uh, fairly modern one. So what you have is the scale protection here, and then you have the monopile foundation and then a transition uh, platform here. The cables generally come down from about this height down to the seabed here. Um, and they're exposed to a lot of this uh, mechanical instability just caused by the, uh, the, the currents and the, the interaction of the structure and also the scour protection around it here. So scour, it's a phenomenon where soils around submerged structures are removed by currents and waves. Um, typically only happens in cohesionless um, sediments, so sand, um, as you have, if you have fine grained sediments, what tends to happen is that they have intramolecular forces which kind of keeps them and, and holds them together so that it's more difficult to erode away. But sand is very easily transported by uh, increased velocity and by vortice shredding caused by those structures and also downstream of the structure. So what happens is the flow accelerates around the structure um, and then you, it leads to vortice shredding, which has a certain type of frequency. Um, and once those kind of swirling motions break apart, they generate eddies that down, create downflows uh, and different uh, horse, horse bend eddies and counter rotating mid wake fit vortices here. Just it, it, it causes quite a lot of disturbance in that flow, causing a reasonable amount of turbulence. Um, and quite severe local scouring can be formed just at the base of that structure where it's accelerated around. Um, and the scour depth has been found to be up to 1.5 times the diameter of the structure. Um, so it's something that it was very poorly understood when we started building wind farms. And what we did when we started building wind farms in the UK was just put these monopile foundations into sand in shallow seas where there was quite a lot of wave action, a lot of tidal forces, and there was a lot of scour that developed as a result of that. So at least we've learned to start kind of about this and what we need to have to do to start protecting these assets. Um, but that primary scour, so the scour that forms just around here, the one that we've started to protect against, it's shown us that there's an additional uh, issue with doing that, which is called secondary scour. Um, so secondary scour happens later and it usually develops downstream of the structure. And that's more because of the impact of the structure on the flow as opposed to the direct impact at the base of the structure. Um, the scour protection or this scour protection, which is typically a rock which is installed to preserve the seabed to stop it from scouring, this can also cause an, an edge effect or secondary scour around it there. And this is particularly problematic if you think about how cables are installed because cables usually come down again down onto that area. So obviously there's a lot of forces that are being enacted upon them. But the problem with secondary scour is we don't really know that much about it. Um, it causes kind of, in some cases, the secondary scour that is created because we're putting more material to prevent scour can cause a deeper scour than there would have been if you just didn't put anything. Um, and also what can happen is if you install two uh, rock berms, so piles of rock over cables very close to each other, they can interact with each other as well and cause collapses and then leading to exposed cables. And when you expose the cables to the flow on, in an unprotected way, it can start vibrating and that vibrating can damage the cable, um, especially the fairly sensitive fiber optics that they have within them for communicating between shore and the wind farm. So what we have here is an example, um, the top example being one of the aforementioned UK wind farms, which was installed just into a sandbank, um, where you can see there's quite a significant 
depth of scala that's developed around the foundation. Um, if you don't mitigate for this, it becomes quite a serious issue um, because that seabed is the initial point of contact where the load is transferred onto. So these uh, piled foundations, they, they get a real hammering, not just by the, the wind and the wave, but also by the motions and the frequencies of the turbine on top of it. So removing what would seem to be a small amount at the top can actually have quite a significant impact. But what happens when you install scale protection as they did? So these two uh, surveys have taken two years apart. You see that there's a much more complex scale pattern that has been developed. And it's also deeper and more extensive once they've installed the scaler, even though what they're trying to do is secure the base of that pile and increase the integrity of the structure. Um, well, well, our current understanding is that the ways that the bed, these bed forms interact with the structure have a role in dictating how um, how that scour develops and the nature of it. I kind of touched upon what, what kind of different geometries and configurations you have in offshore wind farms um, and why cables in these areas are exposed to quite significant loads. Um, so the, the primary failure mechanisms for cables identified in the in joint industry project is mechanical forces and fatigue. Um, and even though we have numerous geometries and configurations like the, this, uh, so this is a jacket foundation, so a different type of foundation, a monopile, you see the cables coming down in the cable protection units. And then these are the, uh, the units that you would put the cable in to ex prevent them from uh, being exposed to make these loads at the, at the foundation. Um, and even though we have a pretty good understanding of what the um, like the normal and extreme loads are at these points, um, it's still a, a, an under, oversimplification because we don't take into account the forces that are creating the secondary scour and the primary scour as well into this. What you can also have is or it's quite a hot topic is uh, the scour of cables. So most of the published models that you can find in the literature don't account for the interaction of bed forms when it comes to cable scouring. Um, they just usually assume a clear seabed and either a simple one direction or bi-directional flow. Um, but the cable, the cable, if you install it in uh, an area where you have mobile bed forms, that cable has a higher specific gravity, it's, it's heavier, so it will start sinking. And cable self-burial has been observed um, and has been problematic when you need to go and replace cables that you've installed on the surface um, you, because you thought they were temporary. Um, but I suppose the thing is that these cables, they, they cross really huge distances, you know, up to hundreds of kilometers. So you are really crossing a, a large number of different lithologies as you are going out from the shore to your offshore wind farm site. So it's really hard to understand which areas that you might be able to put a cable on the, on the seabed or to understand where certain bed forms may interact negatively with the cable. So they're the key issues that we are trying to look at and address and just improve understanding of. And I'm going to just run through now and explain to you exactly kind of how, yeah, how we're going to try and do that. Um, so this is just a quick flow chart to show it. Um, so we're going to look to do a forensic analysis of what these cable failures are relative to the different types of structures, relative to the different types of cables, and then try and use that to identify the key parameters that is linked to the failure of the cable and also the environmental uh, so the seabed type, the sediment type, the water depth, and the meteorological conditions and the tidal forces, just to try and understand kind of where if there's any patterns in there that can be avoided when you consider other sites in the northeast coast of America. Um, and then what the idea is to use a GIS database. So GIS stands for Geographic Information System. Um, it's just a uh, a way of collecting and storing information while preserving its geographical location. So using this, we try and do a fairly data driven model to understand kind of scour for cables and subsea uh, and structures, depending on the geological settings and hydrodynamic conditions and the water depth, etc. And then 
that's going to be supported by numerical modeling and testing of that database and the results by comparing against data that we've got from previous installations. So we again just leaning on this European experience where we have the information and we have a fairly good understanding to try and validate models so that we can then start forecasting and predicting and understanding what could be an issue for developers in the US. Um, and the final stage is to produce technical publications uh, and GIS risk maps, maps for the US continental shelf, just to try and provide uh, a bit of a guide based on uh, the failures that we've recorded, what could be problematic in America. Um, so a lot of this is be building on the work from the uh, the CALM and the ORE Catapult, which are a British organisation, which are trying to accelerate the development of offshore wind in the UK. Um, so the key idea is to identify those morphologically and hydrodynamically similar regions either side of the Atlantic. So you've got your European example and you have your American example and trying to understand which sites are best suited for that initial comparison. Um, so it, we're going to try and consider three regions. So you've got the Atlantic Northeast Shore, Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Northwest. And you, each of those are, you know, very different shelfful environments. Um, so the idea is to try and concentrate on the northeast of the US first and um, where they're actively developing wind farms and where the correlation with British and European wind farms is stronger. Um, again, try and identify what those key variables are to take forward. And then also remember that kind of climate is has a you know huge role in how how these threats might be realized in the ocean as well as climate change is shown to have increased the severity of storm events um, and also the average wave and wind currents as well in certain regions, especially during the storm seasons. So it's about trying to understand whether or not that factor of safety which is being applied is enough to account for any in or worsening uh, weather conditions. Uh, if you actually look at European cable failure, um, what they, the Cable Lifetime Monitoring Project did is they approached contractors and developers and consultancies and gathered information that they would agree would be anonymized just to try and understand as an industry what was being done well and what was being done badly and if there were any correlations. And then they just tried to look between, they divided it between different cable types. The primary one was the voltage, so if it was a medium voltage, high voltage or extremely high voltage, and then HVDC. So that, that depending on the, yeah, a, a DC cable would generally be a longer cable. Uh, high voltage would generally be for a later wind farm because the size of these turbines are getting bigger and bigger. Medium voltage, is, you could assume to be a, quite early wind farm to maybe a smaller wind farm these days. Um, and then they tried to divide the failure mechanism so that you could look at the ones related to design, manufacture, and then also for the um, installation and operational mechanisms, just to treat, try and kind of split out these different pairs to understand if there was anything connecting these. I think for me looking at it and from my experience and from what I've seen, it's always this idea of mechanical fatigue. So failure to correct the design for T at J tubes, um, J tubes being the point at which the cable exits the foundation and becomes exposed in the into the hydrodynamic regime. Um, cables not being designed to cope with the appropriate forces. Cable designed for inappropriate. Yeah, so as you see with it, most of these cables, there is always a mechanical element to it, um, and this is something that yeah, there must be a reason. Either we're not kind of accounting for it, or we we don't really understand exactly what's going on down there and this is yeah our idea of trying to understand this more so when you think about the gis database you've got quite a lot of geographic information now which is available publicly and you might be amazed if you wanted to see quite high resolution bathymetry so the CPA topography for most kind of developed nations you can get quite high resolution data these days and um, so as, as we can see here, this is just off the northeast continental shelf of the US, where you can see these uh, subsea canyons cutting through the continental shelf here before you go onto the oceanic plate. 
So this is it's quite easy to get. What would be a high resolution data to support this? Um, this is going to help when we try to identify the representative case studies from uh, America to try and match to the European um, examples. Um, again, three key environmental variables. It's it's difficult this time to know exactly which of these are going to be, and that's where one of the aspects that we're going to hope. To, well, we're aiming to try and use AI just in this to try and understand better and find the links that are passive or active links between the different uh, geometries and also these kind of, I guess, what would be the, the primary controls. Um, so mostly water depth, tidal strength or tidal cycle amplitude, and also the grain size of the sediments at the seabed. Um, So this one probably maybe shows a bit more uh, systematically how it all stitches in together. Um, so you have expect those two types of scour. So you've got the primary scour. And um, so we'll have to try and this is the in the purple is the elements that we're going to achieve through the computation of fluid dynamics. So looking at the ex expected depths relative to the cable piles and jackets, just the primary scour and look at that time depth relationship. And then also look at after that and the development of the secondary scour. So the relationship between the scour protection and also the scour protection dimensions with the extent and depth of secondary scour. Um, the GIS database will then try and collect together those key items um, just to try and build this generic regional model so that we can try and point it and understand where these different uh, provinces are across the US where risk might be particularly high. So we've got the USGS seabed database. So we have uh, a database which gives us the composition of the seabed materials as understood, and then also uh, NOAA, um, yeah, bathymetric data that I showed on the other side. One of the key considerations is also biota. Um, so biofilms contribute to sediment cohesion. So biofilms are um, organisms that live in the water, so phytoplankton, uh, algae, and the impact that they have is they tend to lead to an increased cohesion between sediments, which that means the more cohesive the sediment is, the more difficult it is for the currents to erode it away. So that's unfortunately a very difficult thing to try and model and understand. Um, in computational fluid dynamics. And so that's why it's just in a box by itself over here. Um, just to try and understand, you know, what difference there will be in these different climates, different, uh, different water temperatures, um, and, and just generally different biotas between the US and the Europe. Um, I've spoken a bit about computational fluid dynamics. Um, so it's a branch of fluid mechanics that deals with numerical simulation of fluid flow uh, and heat transfer. And um, so what it basically involves is using computers to solve complex comp uh, calculations about what happens when you have water flowing through or air flowing through a medium and what happens if it's obstructions. Um, it's used widely in Formula One to try and understand the aerodynamic impact of different parts. It's used in cycling to understand if people have got a good aerodynamic position uh, and, and now we're, all, we're also using it for understanding the interaction between flows and particles. Um, so it does this by being able to calculate the distribution of bed shear stress. So that shear stress is the ability of that water to start particles, getting them rolling, bouncing, saltating and then eventually transported. Um, by having that water flowing over it. So high shear bed stresses generally equals increased erosion, while if there's less shear bed stresses, i.e. low flow, it might might uh, yeah, cause sediment deposition. So that flow is so slow that the material that's in the water will just settle out of it. Um, and I think that understanding the spatial variation of that shear bed stress should help understand what those macro erosion and deposition patterns are. So basically what we can do is by simulating this fluid flow over this medium or over a, a seabed, which is non-static, 
one that we can if we can have generated bed forms on it, then we can help reproduce those sedimentary processes and the interaction between the structures, the scale protection and the seabed and then understand how these. Yeah, how, how much are these impacting the flow? So the basis of the, these models that we are kind of building on from are basically from oil and gas exploration. Um, so these models were initially used to understand the stratigraphy of infragravity flows or subgravity flows. Um, these are flows that become self-propelling down a continental shelf. And what you have is you have these huge landslides that can go on for thousands of kilometers down these really steep continental shelves, such as the one we saw in the earlier slide. Um, it's important because the nature of these flows and also the settlements and how they eventually settle at the bottom or on the shelf, they generally dictate where the layers of sand will be and where those layers of sand, which are, are likely to be sealed between cohesive units. So basically, if you have a layer of sand which has uh, biogenic material in it, then that's more likely to be where you're going to have your reservoirs develop and you might have oil reservoirs. So the thinking being, if you could reconstruct these flows and understand how the, set, the sediment settles within it, then you can use that to try and map out your basin to understand where you're best to target your oil exploration. Um, so what we're trying to do is to invert that a little bit and then take that understanding and apply it to an open channel. So we want to try and consider what an open channel would look like and what happens when you interact the flow with a structure and the bed forms around it. Um, so the computation fluid dynamic model will give us kind of unidirectional and bidirectional, and also we can uh, include turbulence in the flow so that it's more representative as opposed to just a clear laminar flow going past something. Um, I've got some more information on there. Uh, so, but yeah, maybe you've read it while I was talking, but this is probably a bit more of the interesting part of, of it. So this is uh, a snapshot of the uh, computational fluid dynamic model that we have developed so far for the project. Um, what it's showing is the flow of the water and the magnitude of the velocity as it's going past the structure. And um, so as you can see, Quite clearly, the turbulence within that flow is being represented and replicated fairly well. It's because of the impact of this turbulence, it's not quite as clear as the vortice shredding graphic that we saw earlier, because it's, yeah, th this turbulence does just generate a more chaotic flow. Um, what happens then is if we include seabed sediments. So what we've done is we've moved the model along and we've put in a structure. So the, the power of CFD is that you could be quite flexible with putting different structures in. You can add scour protection layers. You can make complex geometries like jackets. And what you can do is you can start then looking at how that flow interacts around it. And you can see here how the bed forms are slowly migrating along in the direction of the flow. And the primary scour is starting to develop here. Um, this is only a very short extract from the model quite early on, but as it would develop further, what you would have is this sediment would continue to be transported out of the open channel. Uh, this is just in one direction. So what we're starting to do now is starting to build pictures or kind of start with understanding how it is with one flow in a single direction and then another flow and then you can look at bi-directional and try and then piece together what that would look like if there's slight variations in your orientation of that flow and just what we can do is if we go back to this the previous uh, slide what we can then do is we can understand how at different heights at the monopile that flow is being uh, in, impacted and um, how much turbulence there is, how much force there is that can impact things higher up. Then once we have an idea and we're happy that we can reconstruct to a similar extent what these processes are by modeling it, then what we need to do is hindkist it against 
actual field data so make sure that we're not just you know making something and not having any basis for it and not really testing our hypotheses that we've been able to recreate something um so that's i think the it's probably the, the the most important part to make that a coupled uh solution so that where you have the computational fluid dynamic and the geotechnical data to be able to sustain it um the forecast Modeling is more about trying to identify the likely scour behavior at different locations based on one that global GIS model will say and based, based on the CFD results. Um, that once you know that, then you can start doing risk mapping to understand where along that competent international shelf this is likely to be of significant impact, just so that developers can yeah uh, understand what risks they probably need to be concentrating on. Um, the forecast modeling, I think, again, we want to try and understand what kind of um, future implications will be if there's rapid climatic change. Um, so using machine learning and neural, uh, neural networks to try and understand and assess the sensitivities for these different morph dynamic regimes. Um, as you can see, this is a diagram showing the annual global wave power of the Southern Ocean is uh, yeah that near Antarctica, so you can see that one is increasing quite dramatically. But every single ocean is gradually increasing as well, so there is an increase in wave power just over the course of the year. So, in summary, um, we've been awarded a significant OESI research grant alongside the University of Florida to investigate geotechnical operating windows of subsea cables. Um, the project wants to produce openly accessible reports for cable designers, uh, developers, installers and maintenance personnel to make it more safe and more economically viable for offshore wind in America um, by understanding and leveraging what that European offshore wind experience is and understanding its relevance for the Euro uh, American continental shelf. Uh, we're going to do that with databases to try and define quite relevant morphodynamic provinces based on the seabed conditions that we think will impact scour most. Uh, then we're going to deploy numerical modeling and hydro of the hydrodynamic forces to understand the impact of primary and secondary scour and understand what those interactions are between these bed forms and the stresses that are being applied at the cables um, and then refine that against hydrogen casting through data that we already have collected. Thank you.